webinar. Um, we have a wonderful guest presenter. Her name is Diane Brennan. But before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that you will all be in listen-only mode, and you'll have the option to type in questions at the end on the right-hand side of your computer, along with finding handouts there. And at the end, we do have a poll uh, voluntarily if you would like to take it. And so I want to let everyone know a little bit about our guest speaker today. Diane Brennan is a licensed mental health counselor and national certified counselor, specializing in grief and loss. She focuses on facilitating personal growth through compassionate care, emotional support, and education. She has been featured in the documentary, The Secret Map of Surviving Loss, a film that tells the story of five individuals and their personal journey through loss. Diane holds a BS from Marist College in Business Finance and an MS in Mental Health Counseling from Pace University. And today she will be discussing understanding the journey of grief. So please, Diana, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Heather, for that lovely introduction. And good afternoon to everyone who's on the line. I am really happy um, to be able to talk to all of you um, today about the journey of grief. Um, what I do is I help people who have experienced a life-changing loss as they go through their grieving process. And today, I want to share some information with you about grief and bring some understanding to what the journey of grief is all about. So this is me, just so you have a picture in mind of who I am and, and what I look like. And um, as we you know, talk, it's always nice to have that reference point. Um, and here's our roadmap for the talk. So um, we're going to start talking a little bit about the, the grief journey um, and explore that together. Um, first, from the perspective of loss. And then, as, um, as we kind of look at loss, we'll begin to talk about grief as a response to loss. And we'll also um, touch upon caregiving and how grief um, factors into that. Um, and once we've done that, um, we'll talk about ways that you can take care of grief. And we'll end with a few resources that might be helpful um, to either yourself as you're grieving a loss or perhaps um, someone that you know um, who is grieving a loss in their life. So with that, um, let's start by kind of thinking about the grief journey. And, you know, there really kind of are no directions um, for this journey. Uh, what we know is that grief is a unique experience um, based upon kind of each person, their situation, um, their, cur their current circumstances. Um, there really are kind of so many factors. So although there are no kind of specific directions for how to get from point A to point B, there certainly are ways that we can understand what grief is and how we can support those who are going through the process of grieving a loss. So let's start by talking about some different types of loss because it all begins with a loss. Um, there are different types of loss and you know they can all be life-changing. Um, I have found in my work with people that the grief you can feel around any of the losses listed here and the depth of pain that you can feel um, can be surprising, can be overwhelming, and um, um, sometimes unexpected. So when we think about loss and we think about um, grief, lots of times, you know, death and dying are what, um, are what we think about. Although, you know, we do have loss um, when it comes to divorce or um, separation um, from someone or the breakup of a, a romantic relationship or even a friendship. Um, and then there are losses associated with um, illness. You know, when we get sick, there are things that we may no longer be able to do, or we may lose, you know, capacity or functioning or, or become disabled in some way, and that can have a huge impact um, on our life and what we're able to do. Um, there's also loss associated with 
you know, our home. We have attachment to our home and uh, there's safety around that and um, our personal possessions. So when uh, we lose something or uh, when that's no longer available to us, um, we can have grief associated with that type of loss in our life. Um, and certainly, you know, we know that there's loss associated when um, perhaps we uh, lose our job or um, have a financial loss in our life. Um, and certainly, um, you know, the last uh, bullet there on the slide, which talks about the loss of companionship and, and pets, which are, which are also um, kind of near and dear to us. So, you know, many different types of loss can, can set us forward on the journey of grief. And when you think about loss, we experience loss across our lifespan. And this is a picture of, you know, a timeline um, where you see kind of at the top, these are, you know, some kind of positive things that happen in our life. And on the bottom, these are the losses we experience. And as we move through, through our life from childhood through, you know, adulthood, we see that loss can happen at all different ages, at all different times. Um, at all different stages of our life. And, you know, loss comes in all different shapes and sizes, and we adapt to it in many different ways. Um, and it's important sometimes to look at the loss, you know, kind of across our life, because as we experience new losses, we can um, be triggered or they can remind us of some of our past losses. And they can bring back feelings and thoughts of perhaps, you know, unresolved um, grief that, you know, we didn't necessarily um, kind of address when the loss happened. So, you know, in this example here and in this timeline, you know, you can see um, kind of the fluctuation of loss, you know, over this kind of 40, 45 year um, time span and um, certainly see that there are also periods where maybe there's more loss um, that's present in our life than others. And so, you know, kind of looking at it sometimes, you know, across our lifespan can help us um, see kind of the trajectory of loss. So when we think about loss um, and when you've had a loss, there are terms that, you know, we commonly hear associated with loss in our life. Um, certainly, you know, grief um, being the first one. And grief is, is really simply defined as our response to loss. And it can, you know, take on many different forms, which we're going to talk about. And, and when you hear the term grief, it's most commonly associated with a loss um, due to the death of someone in our life although grief is kind of the response to all loss. The second term, you know, that we hear quite often is bereavement. And bereavement um, really describes the condition or the state that someone is in as a result of a loss. And um, it really refers to kind of the period of time that we are in this state. And um, quite honestly, grief and mourning are part of this process or part of this state. Um, and mourning is described as, or, or defined as the public or outward expression of our grief. So think about funerals, memorial services, or, you know, think about the time when people wore black. Um, to symbolize, you know, their loss and, and to let people know, hey, I'm grieving, um, be gentle with me. And what I, why I wanted to take a moment to define um, these terms is that when we have a loss, sometimes we hear them um, interchangeably uh, used um, in conversation. And so, you know, just kind of talking about and defining them um, gives us a touch point um, for when we use them going forward in our conversation today. So when we think about grief, um, what we know is that it is a natural process that we all go through. And I wanted to give a shout out here to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is really the kind of pioneer in um, the study of death and dying. Certainly her book on death and dying, which was written in 
1969, and it opened up a public dialogue about grief. And, um, you know, in my practice today and in my conversations with people about grief, many times um, they refer to the Elizabeth Kubler Ross stages of grief. And, um, you know, certainly uh, her work has been expanded upon, and, and, um, and uh, you know, the, the field of, of grief research and study has evolved since then, although she really um, kind of gets credit for starting um, the public dialogue. And, you know, this quote here um, is, um, I think, um, a great quote about, you know, the reality is that you grieve forever and that you will kind of learn to live with it. Um, you will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered, and you will be whole again, although you will never be the same again. And nor should you want to be, uh, uh, you know, kind of be uh, the same after. So we're going to talk a little bit more now about the different types of grief um, that, um, that people experience and, you know, some of the terms that uh, define uh, grief and the grieving process. And some of these may be familiar to you um, and some may be new. Uh, but essentially, um, the, you know, you can see how uh, the, the field of grief and research um, has certainly expanded, you know, from uh, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross model. And, um, you know, we, we know that there's um, grief that's uh, called anticipatory grief. And Therese Rando did a lot of research um, in this area. And anticipatory grief is um, the grief reaction that occurs before an impending loss. And it's really something common amongst caregivers, um, particularly as they watch um, a disease progress. Um, then there's acute grief. And, and acute grief is that kind of intense, um, emotional pain that we have immediately following a loss. And what we find is that um, acute grief naturally evolves into integrated grief, which is kind of over time the grief and the loss just becomes, you know, a part of our lives and the intensity of the emotion and the intensity of the pain kind of reduces and kind of we find a way um, to live with the loss. You know, there's also something called disenfranchised grief. And disenfranchised grief, there's a lot of great research by Ken Doka. And um, this is when our grief is not acknowledged by society. And, you know, there's usually t some type of social stigma associated with our grief. And, you know, think of things like um, suicide or um, overdose or even um, HIV and AIDS. Um, abortion, you know, would be another um, example. And, you know, this is when someone else is saying, you don't have the right to grieve. There's also um, an emerging field of study around traumatic grief, which is, you know, um, really uh, some great research by Selby Jacobs around, you know, grief and considering grief as both a result of, you know, a loss or a death in your life and traumatic distress. So, you know, think about um, something that involves kind of abrupt, unexpected loss um, and some, you know, type of trauma associated with that. Then there's ambiguous grief, and this was um, also, you know, something researched by uh, Pauline Boss. And ambiguous grief is when we're grieving someone who's still alive. You know, the person is physically there, um, but not psychologically there. So, you know, certainly uh, we see this with Alzheimer's and dementia. We also can see it with addiction, when the addiction takes over. Um, also different forms of mental illness or, you know, even um, traumatic brain injury where, you know, the person is physically there but not psychologically um, there. And the last, you know, kind of different uh, type of grief I wanted to comment on or introduce you to is complicated grief. And this has been, you know, studied quite a bit by um, Catherine Shear. And this is when uh, grief becomes... Um, somewhat of a bit of a chronic state where it continues to remain and feel acute over time. So 
earlier, you know, I, I talked about kind of the acute grief, that initial grief, that intense grief, um, transforming into integrated grief. And sometimes that doesn't kind of naturally happen for people or people get stuck a little bit more in the uh, acute grief. And so, you know, it could be a year, two years later, five years later, where, you know, that, uh, that, that feeling of grief is still pretty intense. And, you know, that's when we see it as complicated grief. So there are all different types of grief here that, that um, we can experience. And uh, we have, you know, many different responses and reactions to these different types of grief. So when we think about um, individual grief responses, you know, we can look at it kind of in this spectrum of, you know, emotional responses like uh, sadness, anger, or kind of loneliness, you know, more like kind of mental responses of, you know, we hear people say, especially early on in their grief, there's confusion or they can't concentrate or they're forgetting things, you know, where are my keys or, you know, what did, what did I do or not do, like those types of things. Um, in addition, we have behavioral responses, which um, can, you know, be crying or not crying, right? We always say that, you know, the amount of tears you cry is not uh, reflective of the amount of pain um, that you're feeling. Um, there's also avoidance of grief, and sometimes, you know, people hide their grief from others. They don't want them to know um, how much pain they're in, um, so they're masking it. We also have physical responses to our grief uh, where we can have, you know, sometimes some aches and pains in our body or sometimes people describe heaviness in their chest or, you know, sometimes there's uh, sympathy pains, which is when we know our, the person um, that we love is no longer uh, here, sometimes we feel similar pains um, that they felt. Um, there's also social responses uh, to our grief, you know, where we may isolate and not want to go out and engaged. We may just have diminished interest in, you know, things that we used to love and, and used to enjoy doing. Um, and we also see sometimes uh, friendships becoming redefined. So think of, you know, I used to go out um, as a couple and now I can no longer do that. Um, those friendships may be uh, redefined or you may have uh, friends that don't um, understand your grief or don't want to talk about it and um, the friendship gets redefined as a result. And there's also spiritual responses to our grief. Um, sometimes we question our faith, our spirituality. Um, sometimes we embrace it more and, and you know, kind of go deeper into it. And sometimes we just quite simply wonder um, about kind of what what happens and, and you know, um, how does this fit in um, to my life? And the thing about our, our grief reactions is, you know, they're not necessarily all independent of each other. What happens is um, they kind of, you know, come and go and uh, accumulate and the, they're, they're kind of piling up together. And when they pile up together, it can certainly feel um, pretty overwhelming. So, you know, we know, you know, that grief is a response to the loss that we've had. And we know that we have, you know, these different responses and reactions. And I thought it would be good to talk about um, kind of what we know about grief and some of the research that has been done. And I wanted to share a few models with you um, that I like and I find, um, you know, seem to resonate when I share them with others. So the first is uh, continuing bonds. And you know, this was um, some of the first research that told us that the grieving process isn't necessarily linear and that you, um, that in your grief, you're really um, kind of looking for uh, a way to connect um, with the person um, or your loss kind of after death. And that, you know, um, through doing that, uh, you are not necessarily denying or avoiding your grief. Um, and what you are is you're, you're finding ways to kind of memorialize and remember them. And that basically maintaining a bond and with the person is essential to the grieving process. And, you know, this was, um, you know, somewhat, um, somewhat new and different in that it wasn't about kind of detaching, but it was about continuing. 
And so, you know, this research uh, kind of came out in around 1996, and um, and then we started to see, you know, the evolution of this, and you know, the dual process model um, a few years later, which you know, this this model is, uh, or the main point of this is that uh, there's this oscillation that happens between um, loss-oriented stressors, kind of the things that make us focus on our, our grief and the loss, and there's also restoration-oriented activities that we engage in, um, which help us focus on daily life tasks and kind of avoiding our grief. And so it's through this kind of back and forth um, where we are confronting and avoiding um, our loss that actually allows us to heal. And, you know, it really uh, speaks to people in that, you know, this is what happens as we're grieving a loss is that, you know, we could be going on with, with our kind of daily life and then, you know, boom, something happens to remind us of the loss and brings us kind of into our grief. But it's through that process where we find our healing. The last model I wanted to just reflect upon for a minute is um, the four tasks of mourning. And this is um, basically what this is saying is that these tasks are essential um, to our mourning and that there's no particular order and that we're going to go back and forth between these tasks um, in that um, you know, it's really about kind of accepting the reality of the loss. And I think that's important that it's about the reality of the loss. You know, we may never fully um, want to say, uh, some people will say, like, I don't, um, I don't want to accept it, but it's just kind of acknowledging the reality that it happened and working through the pain of our grief and adjusting to the environment, the new environment. And, you know, finding, you know, again, it's kind of finding that connection, that enduring connection um, as we're kind of embarking on a new life. And, and you know, we may go through these tasks um, in different ways at different times, um, and you may go through one and then go back and revisit it, uh, but the idea is that you, um, through your kind of mourning and grieving process, you're going to kind of complete or accomplish all of these tasks. So um, it really kind of gives us a nice um, kind of framework for what happens um, as we're grieving a loss. And earlier on, you know, we talked a bit about um, kind of caregiving and grief and kind of how does that uh, fit in. And I wanted to just take a moment, you know, to reflect on that because through the caregiving experience, kind of there is this kind of path or trajectory which happens, which is, you know, the individual that we're caring for um, kind of experiences some onset of the illness, then there's a series of doctor visits and diagnosis, and then um, there could be patient losses that are associated with the illness and caregiver losses and kind of this ongoing and continuous, continuous cycle of loss where there's a lot of anticipatory grief that we, you know, talked about earlier, which is the kind of anticipation of another loss. And, you know, we see losses as um, somewhat multifaceted, right? It could be loss of independence, loss of dreams, um, you know, loss of privacy, um, you know, family life changes, work life changes, um, you know, all, all of these different losses that are somewhat tangible and, and maybe almost abstract, right? But they are um, happening and we are experiencing lots of anticipatory grief and, you know, our kind of thoughts and feelings and, you know, our reactions and responses are similar to what we, we spoke of earlier, right? There could be isolation and frustration and resentment. Um, and there's also hope, right, for the, for the future um, or hope that we hold on to. Um, but there is, um, you know, certainly guilt and anger all built up in that. And so, you know, through this experience, um, you know, how can we kind of support ourselves, you know, through this process to help with the losses and even the compounding effect of our grief. So, 
now that we've talked a lot about kind of grief and the grieving process and what happens, I'd like to shift and talk a little bit about how we take care of our grief. And, um, you know, there's a list here of, of many different things that we can do um, to take care of our grief. And there are things on this list that we can do alone or do with others. And it's really whatever kind of works best for the individual. So let's explore some of these together. So when we think about um, taking care of our grief, you know, certainly exercise is something that can be helpful. And um, it really does help us to release some energy, but it also requires us to shift our focus on something other than grief. And it really is kind of whatever works uh, for you, whether it's running, walking, yoga, cycling, weightlifting. I mean, you know, it could be, um, you know, many different uh, forms, but, you know, finding something and uh, committing uh, to doing it. Um, but then there's also kind of deep breathing and meditation, right, to create a sense of calmness and relaxation. And, you know, when we take a deep breath, it brings oxygen into our body and um, kind of gives us uh, some relaxation of just both, you know, mind and body. And there's lots of, you know, different apps out there that um, can help with that um, to help, you know, um, create a deep breathing practice or a meditation practice. There's also, when we think about grief, uh, we think about rituals and, you know, kind of sharing um, memories with others. And, you know, this uh, can be done, you know, publicly when we think of things like memorials and, um, you know, people sometimes gather and release balloons or have candlelight vigil, vigils or, you know, gather in small groups, um, you know, to share memories and remembrances of people. And this really kind of facilitates connection and, and meaning making around the loss. Um, but there's also private rituals, you know, that, um, that you can engage in, you know, like going to a favorite restaurant um, or, you know, cooking a favorite dish um, that you, you know, shared with a person, um, kind of walking through the park um, can be um, very healing. Or, you know, um, one of my favorites is donating a book um, to a library in the person's name, so something that they enjoyed um, that you can share with others in their memory. There are many different ways uh, that you can kind of create rituals, which, which really helps to kind of facilitate that ongoing connection that we talked about earlier um, in continuing bonds. And when we also take care of our grief, it's really about self-care. and. Um, and maybe creating sometimes routines. So, you know, it, it really uh, can be about kind of creating a sense of control for ourselves um, because, you know, in our grief, sometimes we we can't necessarily control uh, what's what's happening um, around us or what did happen that led to our grief. So, um, kind of creating routines and and bringing um, some balance into our lives between the loss. Um, and our new life is important. So, um, you know, quite honestly, sometimes it's about facilitating um, and giving ourselves permission to grieve, that, like, it's okay and, and you have the right to grieve. In particular, when we talked about disenfranchised grief and when, when you know, people think you don't have the right to grieve or even, you know, um, you know, people who can't support your grief when we encounter that. But knowing that it's okay and that it is, um, you know, kind of a good thing to do. Um, and also um, thinking about, uh, you know, kind of information, what to expect. Many times, you know, people um, kind of encounter the, their grief or go, you know, encounter the grieving process, and, you know, it's new, and they've never felt that way before, and they want to know, is this um, something that others feel, and is this, um, is this what I should be feeling? So. Um, I wanted to just mention this great book, Overcoming Grief, which really provides some great self-care strategies um, to help support people um, through their grieving process. And sometimes our grief, um, it, it can be difficult to express it verbally. And so, you know, things like um, kind of painting um, or using pictures and drawing 
um, to just um, communicate or express our grief is a really great way um, to you know kind of connect with our grief and we don't have to talk about it so whether it is you know kind of drawing a picture of what your grief looks like or you know thinking about that mask sometimes that we put on during the day when we go out and you know when we talked about uh, grief earlier in our responses to grief we we talked about the the different ways or the different um, what we talked about was um, kind of the different ways that we can express um, our grief and um, and you know kind of putting that mask on or hiding it um, from others um, you know we could put this mask on and so sometimes it's helpful um, to draw that mask so we can give ourselves permission um, to take it off and not hide behind it any longer um, the other um, the other way that we can kind of uh, take care of our grief is through writing and journaling and with writing and journaling it can create a safe place for us to kind of feel the emotions of grief and explore maybe the different stories um, that we associate with it so you know quite honestly sometimes a blank notebook or a journal is a great thing to just write your thoughts as they come up um, you know kind of free form unscripted you know, stream of consciousness, and that can really um, work well uh, for some people. Um, for others, though, it's um, you know, it might help to have some structure and and some prompts, and maybe even kind of a framework. So, I wanted to share these two resources that um, I've used. One is a book called Healing After Loss, and you know, just uh, gives uh, some some great perspectives or some some great um, kind of prompts around loss and different ways to look at it and different ways to think about it and then you know allows you the opportunity to, to write about kind of that thought or that perspective um, and also you know progressing through grief is is like a nice structured journal that you can use um, to kind of write your write about your grief and it kind of gives you prompts through a very um, you know kind of structured process for your writing so either way um, the point here is it doesn't have to all be about talking about your grief that you can take care of your grief you know certainly in other ways or, or nonverbal ways um, so with that um, there are also some great kind of online resources um, that exist um, and I wanted to you know, share a few here as well. So certainly there is um, modernloss.com, which you know people share their stories of loss, and it gives um, it gives uh, you an opportunity to relate to kind of other people and their loss. Um, What's your grief has you know great resources available as well. And um, something uh, if you want to do more kind of meditation and um, you know, breathing, mindfulness, and grief is a wonderful um, website that has some guided meditations that you can engage in. Um, the the Dougie Center's website has some great information um, that, about uh, children and the grieving process, and teens, and um, some great resources. There's complicated the complicated grief website has some great resources, and then for caregivers, um, caregiver.org and, and caring info. So. I just wanted to point these out as um, great resources that can be used and that um, you know you can refer to, um, you know, for uh, for grief and information about grief and loss. So with that, um, I wanted to kind of uh, you know open it up to questions. We can you know go in any direction that you would like. Um, if you, you know, if there's anything you want to talk more about, you know, that we talked about earlier in the um, presentation, I wanted to just give everybody the opportunity um, to ask any questions that might be on your mind um, at this point in time. Okay, so first, thank you so much for such a great presentation, and um, we uh, will, if you have any questions, like I said earlier, just kindly type them in on the right-hand side, and I will read them. Um, 
And we don't have the ability uh, to speak, but again, all lines are muted, but you have the opportunity to type in your questions. Okay, I have one question from Susan. How does grief play into the person who's living with dementia? How do you think grief looks, what do you think grief looks like for them? Hmm, that's an interesting question. So I think that, you know, grief, I, mean, I do believe that grief is a pretty individual process and that it can certainly be, you know, different for each individual and each individual's experience. Um, I do think that, you know, in particular with dementia, you know, some of the things that we had talked about earlier on in, about, you know, kind of ambiguous grief and, you know, depending on where someone's at, you know, kind of in, um, kind of with, with dementia and what kind of, um, what they're experiencing both, you know, physically and mentally, um, you know, certainly um, there is a lot of kind of the ambiguous grief around this person is still alive, but, and they're physically here, but they're not, they're not necessarily psychologically um, available. And so I think that a lot of the, the grief um, is going to look, you know, similar um, to that kind of ambiguous you know, grief, but the specifics of it, you know, when we spoke earlier about the different kind of responses and reactions, um, those are going to be in, um, kind of unique to each individual, right? Some people may have more anger and, uh, you know, about the situation, you know, some may have more um, questioning and, you know, so it, it really depends on the individual. All right, thank you for that. We do have another question from Jeanette. First, she wants to thank you for all the resources, but she, her question is, is there any ongoing things that we can do to support nursing staff? I work in skilled nursing. I worry about our staff. Yeah, I, I, I hear you um, on that, and in particular, you know, uh, for nurses or really any caring profession where you are working with individuals and, you know, kind of seeing losses and see decline, you know, that certainly um, requires um, some time and attention in terms of self-care, um, you know, for, for, for yourself. Um, as an individual and certainly, you know, there's uh, different levels of, you know, kind of burnout that you can experience um, as a result of, you know, just um, kind of always being there and grieving. And look, quite honestly, as a nurse, you know, you're caring for people and you do, you know, become attached to people. So there is, um, there is some kind of grief that needs to be processed when either someone dies or maybe they have to go, you know, to another facility, um, you know, there is some loss around that that, that, um, that can be addressed and whether that, that again is, you know, I would say, um, you know, getting together in small groups maybe with other nurses and talking about it and giving yourself time, you know, to process it, whether you write about it, um, kind of different ways to just acknowledge that that there is a loss associated with that, with caring with someone, even when, you know, even when we're doing it as our profession. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Nicole. Thank you for this. My father has Alzheimer's and he and my mother live with myself and my family. I find myself exhibiting these behaviors and often wonder about avoidance. I deal with all aspects of my father's illness, but often I often find I just can't engage in conversation with him. To me, he is gone. Is this acceptance or avoidance? Do you hear this from others with this ambiguous grief? Heather, can you uh, just read the beginning part of that for me again? My father has Alzheimer's and he and my mother live with myself and my family. I find myself exhibiting these behaviors and often wonder about avoidance. I deal with all aspects of my father's illness, 
but often find I just can't engage in conversation with him. To me, he is gone. Is this acceptance or avoidance? Do you hear this from others with this ambiguous grief? Thank you for re, uh, reading that again. Um, there was a lot there, so I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to miss anything. Um, and you know, in this question, it 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 kind of makes me uh, think a little bit about um, what we spoke about earlier in, in the dual process model. In that, right, there is some of this kind of back and forth of kind of confronting, you know, the reality of what's happening. Um, with your dad and then also kind of avoiding it and just doing the things that you need to do kind of in life so I think that this kind of going back and forth between you know avoidance and acceptance is just a natural part um, of the process and I I would imagine that there's some days where um, it's, it's okay and it feels okay to accept the reality of it and there's some days where you have to just really back off of it um, and avoid it and that it's it's really about you know going between both of those and allowing that to just be part of the grieving process for yourself um, uh, you know as you continue kind of through that caregiver journey that we talked about Heather, do you have any other questions? I have another question. What are some strategies that can be used to help a patient or family member with anticipatory grief caused by disease? Okay. Yeah, so um, anticipatory grief, right? We know that anticipatory grief is really about um, kind of the 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 notion that this loss is is going to happen and um, we see it as um, you know kind of having the grief you know having our grief reaction or experiencing grief kind of before the loss occurs so you know really engaging um, in that conversation and dialogue you know first and foremost I think is helpful and I also think kind of educating. Um, about um, you know this process that this is actually happening um, many times I, I think that with anticipatory grief a lot of um, a lot of times we associate grief with kind of after the person dies or kind of after um, you know kind of after I get through this so many times people want to kind of hold on to it and and you know not talk about it and so um, kind of bringing it out into the open and having a dialogue, educating people about it. And then I would suggest that, um, you know, getting, um, giving them, uh, you know, some of the taking care of grief uh, strategies that we talked about earlier um, in terms of, you know, exercise and self care, especially as someone's caregiving. Many times, you know, the caregiving can be all consuming and, you know, as caregivers, we devote a lot of our focus and energy into the caregiving. And so, you know, sometimes rechanneling that focus back to ourselves um, is important. Um, it's really hard to do. So I don't want to make it sound like it's easy to find, you know, 15 or 20 minutes to get in some exercise. Although I would stress to people how essential it is, you know, for them. All right, thank you. We have another question. We have a ton of questions, so keep them coming. Uh, you're doing a <laughs> great job. Um, from Nancy, her question is, are there specific emotional milestones towards healing as a process? Example, anger, sadness, remorse, numbness, etc. So I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm, uh, like to, uh, I'm going to try to interpret that or respond to that. In it, it sounds like the the question and Heather, just you know, if, I, if you think I have it wrong, jump in here. Is you know, so how do I know I'm feeling better? 
like kind of the are there specific milestones so if like when uh, sometimes I, I think the question is so when how do I know it's over like how do I know you know I'm, I'm feeling better and um, I would say that you know when we when you think about you know the emotional responses like sadness anger um, you know kind of sometimes even regret kind of in there um, what typically happens or what you might look for in terms of milestones is that you know kind of there's an easing of it so you know the sadness and crying you know maybe it's happening you know on a daily basis and then you'll see that it'll start to um, lesson and maybe it is only happening twice a week or once a week you know something along um, kind of those lines and so you know just kind of looking for that the the frequency um, you know to uh, dissipate so I think that that's you know a, you know something that you can look for and I also want to you know say that when we talked about the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, quote, you know, how, you know, with grief that we, um, you know, we, we find ways to adjust and adapt and to kind of live with it. And it, it doesn't mean that we'll never, you know, cry again or be sad about the loss. It, it typically is that we just, uh, the frequency of it um, kind of diminishes as we go from that acute grieving to the more integrated grieving. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful. We have another question from Kelly. I understand that grief process will vary from one individual to another, but is there a general length of time that a person is in deep grief until they reach their new normal state? Gosh, that is, <laughs> um, that is a, a, a great question. And so I do yeah, it does vary, you know, for most people. Although, you know, if you look at the research and you, you know, kind of look at what um, what's out there, you know, typically, you know, people experience like that really acute grief in, you know, the first, you know, kind of three to six months. Although, you know, I know people who that, you know, acute stage lasts for days or weeks. Um, and certainly, you know, you know, know people who, you know, it lasts longer than six months. So, you know, if you, you know, want to kind of take a stab at averages, you know, that might be um, kind of the best time frame to look at. And, and that is typically what you'll see in, in, um, in some of the research. Thank you. I have a question from Stephanie. Is there a standard starting point or resource you would recommend for someone dealing with grief, or is it too individualized? Hmm. Um, you know, I. This is probably uh, more of an opinion, personal preference, <laughs> um, question, um, or or response to the question. Um, and and what I would say is that yeah, there. You know, it's always. Certainly in my practice and working with people, I always like to find out where they're at and, and meet them at that point in their in their grieving process. So um, I'm really mindful of where people are at and where they um, and, and, and figure out what they're experiencing, right? Because when we talked about um, individual grief responses, you know, we talked about the emotional, the mental, the behavioral, physical, social, spiritual, you know, some people experience all of those, some people experience some of those, and, and sometimes it's none of those. <laughs> um, but I would say that um, lots of times people will ask, like, is this normal? Is this what others experience um, with loss? And is this what grief, you know, should look and feel like? So sometimes it's good to start with just educating people about what grief is and a little bit of around you know what we talked about earlier in the presentation that you know there's different models of grief there's different responses that we have and you know just see what resonates for people and and what um, you know what they can connect to so that's what I would that's what I would recommend as a as a starting point <laughs> 
Thank you. We have another question from Sarah. What would you recommend to someone who may be dealing with the loss of a colleague who has a terminal illness and has to help staff members as well as herself through the grief process? and also helping the members of the agency community through this grief? I love this question, and, and here's why. Um, I, I love that you're thinking about it, you know, in the workplace. And I, and I think that, you know, many times we um, kind of ignore it in, at work, or we don't, you know, we don't, you know, kind of acknowledge it or talk about it in the same way. But, you know, grief is grief. And, you know, uh, it, our loss is based on kind of these relationships. So I would say to, to find ways in the workplace to talk about it, meaning, you know, um, get together in small groups, you know, talk about how you're feeling, um, you know, find ways that you might be able to support, you know, this colleague, but, you know, treat it as, you know, um, as you would, um, kind of any loss in your life and that um, you know talk about it with others um, you know m you know form a mini uh, support group um, you know do do some of the think about some of the grief rituals in the shared remembrance that we talked about earlier you know what are ways that you can kind of connect as a as a group of coworkers, um, you know, kind of around this loss because you're all kind of sharing it together. Like maybe you can all, you know, have a walking group where you you talk about walking and uh, or you walk and you talk about your grief. I mean, you know, something that combines a little bit of both, you know, exercise and um, you know, remembrance, um, things like that is what I would say. Get together in a conference room, bring in some, you know, some artwork uh, or some supplies and create some artwork about how you're feeling in your grief. Um, you know, just, I would say, form your own, like, support group right there um, in the workplace. Uh, Sarah also wrote, um, concerning the same work member, she believes it's more anticipatory. She wrote the staff member is still working and shares the experience of her illness and her fears with staff and friends who are staff regularly. Okay, so it sounds yeah. like Heather, they're already sharing and, and talking about okay. it. Is that, okay. yeah, that's which is great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's great, right? Mm -hmm. So we have another question um, from Rebecca Schaefer. The interventions or channels that you mentioned to cope and deal with grief are all wonderful ideas. Would you, however, suggest measures that work more effectively with long-term sadness and our grief, specifically those who are currently exposed to the sort of things that create grief? I think medical professionals was a good example of that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the question here is um, focusing a little bit on um, when we have it's almost like a, like a compounding effect um, of of grief, right? Where kind of we're experiencing kind of ongoing losses, and and how do we deal kind of with the weight of that? So if I guess if that is, you know, some of your professional experience, and so Heather, I think this is coming from a professional perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I would really, you know, think about like what's that, what's the parallel process for self-care, um, you know, in, um, it, you know, you know, for yourself, right? And, and really having a parallel process for self-care that you can engage in on a regular basis, whether, you know, that's um, having a place where you, you can go to talk about it, um, whether it's, you know, having a ritual um, that you've built in, you know, to acknowledge a loss when it happens and when you're experiencing it, but kind of really creating, you know, this kind of self-care parallel process that you can engage in on, on a regular basis. You know, I know that I certainly do that um, as a kind of a, a professional counselor who works with grief and loss 
on a regular basis and um, also you know I had worked full-time in hospice so you know I had kind of a parallel process for my own self-care that I engaged in regularly so that I could um, acknowledge the loss and also um, kind of have a way to support uh, have support mechanisms in place to deal with it. Thank you. Um, I know we uh, have a couple more minutes. Is that okay? We have a couple more questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, Jeanette has a question. A nurse in my care center was providing care for a hospice resident. When the resident stated, I wish I would die faster, nurse redirected the conversation. How could the nurse have handled this differently? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a great question. And uh, this does kind of come from the, your individual comfort level, you know, certainly to engage in that dialogue. Um, but certainly, you know, the, there, there could have been, you know, a conversation around why they felt that way and what was going on for them, um, you know, to certainly uh, just like let them talk and, um, you know, and talk about what they're, you know, experiencing um, versus redirecting it, right? So there was something in that expression of, you know, wanting, um, kind of wanting to die sooner. Um, that you know certainly you know could have been explored versus um, redirecting it, and so I think that 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 would be you know that that's what kind of popped up in my mind, um, you know, and and you know if that nurse didn't particularly feel comfortable, um, then perhaps bringing someone in um, who could have the dialogue, whether it's a colleague or you know, a counselor or, you know, or, or someone else um, to allow that person an opportunity to, to just, you know, share what was going on um, in that moment for them. Thank you. Uh, Ellen loves your presentation. She's saying, excellent, excellent, excellent. You're a life <laughs> and, um, she is very happy and she loves it. Thank you, Ellen. Um, your life and loss timeline is such a great piece. Have you ever actually had a do-it-yourself workshop that encourages people to do their own timeline? I'd really like to know about its success. If you have, I'd like to try it. Um, so, um, Ellen, truth be told, that that is um, that timeline um, is my timeline that I that I created, and I did that. Um, uh, kind of early on in my uh, in my process um, of you know kind of wanting to work with people around grief and loss to really kind of understand my own journey and what my my touch points were um, I've never kind of uh, brought that into a workshop format I have done it with individuals so um, and I think earlier some of the questions were about like you know kind of loss over time and um, when I work with someone who's had you know a lot of loss or you know some significant uh, losses um, we do a timeline together to really take a look at that um, so I think um, I see your point <laughs> um, about you know doing a workshop I think for in particular for um, professionals um, who work with a lot of loss doing that timeline is a great exercise so you know what your triggers are and you know even to go back to the earlier comment about um, it, or the earlier question about um, you know the nurse being confronted with the question of death you know it might have been hard for her to respond to that question because it would have triggered some other loss that she had so um, kind of doing the timeline as a professional is a really great tool um, so that you you can leverage it um, as part of your own self-care knowing um, that people uh, that that when you talk to people about their losses and their grief it's going to touch your own and knowing how you deal with that so I think it's a, a great idea uh, around doing a workshop and um, you know something to keep in mind so um, thank you for those comments and, and thank you for um, for letting me know how much you enjoyed the presentation and our last question is for from Don uh, 
are there studies that show that dementia patients feel sadness even if they cannot talk about it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I there's nothing that I know of that comes to mind in terms of a of a particular study, um, and and I think it's a it's a great great question about um, about the having those feelings and not being able to express them. Um, so certainly um, something that uh, I would kind of look out for but there's nothing I know of to to point you to so I'm sorry I don't have a anything in particular around that but it certainly is a great question um, and I would I would wonder you know about that as well so um, so something to look to look for and who knows you know maybe there's a whole other presentation in that Heather <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't have a like a study but you know, here at the foundation, we say, you know, let's look at the signs. So if they can't talk, are they tearful? Um, are they moving in a certain way, looking at their body language, looking at, you know, um, just the outer signs that one might present when they could feel sadness? Um, I think that could give us cues and always recognizing that there's a reason for maybe the tearfulness and, and knowing the person and knowing what they're going through in that moment. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a study. I think, Don, that's an amazing thing. Um, and if you have further questions, you could always uh, give us a call on our helpline at 866-232-8484. Um, and so that wraps up our Q&A. Uh, I just want to quickly let everyone know um, that this coming June, it's Dementia Care Professionals Month. And here at the foundation, we're celebrating professionals by offering a discount on our AFA Partners in Care, supporting individuals living with dementia training DVD. And that is a 25% discount. I also want to let everyone know that next month, June 8th, our topic is going to be understanding emergency preparedness. And we're going to have a really good uh, presentation on what we could do to prepare for those emergencies and keep our loved ones safe. Lastly, uh, AFA is celebrating our 15th anniversary and we're going all around the United States. And so on May 19th, we will be in Philadelphia at the Hilton Penn Landing. And on June 7th, we will be at Tennessee at the Franklin Theater. These are free educational conferences. I want to thank you, Diane, so much. I certainly learned new things today. I know um, we all learned something new today. And thank you for taking time and answering all our questions. You did a wonderful job. And I hope you and everyone else has a great rest of the day and weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>